to page 134, we have now talked about thyrotropic hormone stimulating the thyroid, adrenocorticotropic hormone stimulating the adrenal cortex to secrete glucocorticosteroids like cortisol, and the two gonadotropic hormones, FSH and LH, and what they do to the gonads or reproductive organs. We have two last pituitary hormones. There is a growth hormone and prolactin. Prolactin is actually uh, mentioned on uh, the bottom of page 130. It is also known as lactogenic hormone. Lacto means milk. The sugar that's in milk is called lactose. If a woman is producing milk, we say she's lactating. So prolactin is the hormone that stimulates the production of milk in the mammary glands. Now you might be thinking, wait a second, Professor Fink, didn't we already cover this? We talked about, what was it? Oxytocin. Oxytocin does not cause the production of milk in the mammary glands. You'd say, well, what does it do? It did two things we learned, oxytocin. We said it caused the uterus to contract, labor contractions, and it caused milk letdown. You'd say, that's it, right? Milk let? No. It causes the milk, or whatever is fluid is in the mammary glands, to squirt out, to come out. It doesn't cause the production of the milk. So prolactin causes the milk to be produced, and oxytocin causes it to come out. So we can see that a woman who's nursing her baby could have actually two different problems, at least two different problems. It could be that she, does, she has prolactin, so she's got milk in her uh, breasts, but it's not coming out because she doesn't have oxytocin. It could also be that she's got oxytocin, but she doesn't have enough prolactin to cause the production of the milk. Is both for prolactin and oxytocin, what stimulates the production of both of them is suckling or nursing. That's, that's required. But there's one more problem here. Looking back at our overall picture on 134, uh, we want to remind you of something. So prolactin causes milk production in the mammary glands. Are the mammary glands an endocrine gland? No. Now, the tropic hormones affected endocrine glands. Thyrotropic hormone caused the thyroid to release thyroxin, which had a negative feedback back to the pituitary. Adrenocorticotropin caused the adrenal cortex to release cortisol, which had a negative feedback back to the pituitary. Uh, FSH caused the production of estrogen, which had a negative feedback to the pituitary. LH caused uh, the secretion of progesterone, which had a negative feedback back to the pituitary. In the case of prolactin, there's no negative feedback. Milk doesn't go into the bloodstream and inhibit the pituitary. So this cannot be regulated through a negative feedback. So if we go back to page 127, back to page 127, you'll notice that on the lower right, we saw that for growth hormone and prolactin, there is not only a releasing hormone, there is an inhibitory hormone. So for these two, because growth hormone and prolactin are not tropic hormones, these are the tropic hormones, these affect other endocrine glands that have a negative feedback loop, the growth hormone and prolactin do not affect endocrine glands, there's no negative feedback loop, so you actually have to have a neurotransmitter, one that causes the release of the hormone and the other that inhibits the release. Same thing is true with growth hormone because there's no negative feedback. There's no hormone coming back to the pituitary. Let's summarize uh, prolactin by looking at page 134C. And on page 134C, So on 134C, it says growth hormone and prolactin. Looking at prolactin, where does it come from? The adenohypothesis, 134C. What does it do? It stimulates the mammary glands to produce milk. And what are the factors? 
What are the factors that stimulate the release of prolactin? PRH and nursing. Prolactin releasing hormone. And what are the factors that inhibit the release of prolactin? Uh, PIH, prolactin inhibitory hormone, which we actually now know is dopamine. I'm not going to test you on that, but that's what it is. We know that now. Or and weaning the baby, where you stop having the baby suckle. So this is not a negative feedback. We have to have one, a one way of turning it on and turning it off. There's no negative feedback loop to turn it off through uh, uh, another hormone. Now, uh, growth hormone. Since we're right on this page, let's talk about growth hormone. Growth hormone is released from the adenohypothesis. It obviously stimulates growth. It stimulates especially the growth of the skeleton, the bones of the body. And I'll remind you how that works in a moment. And it also stimulates the growth of muscles. One of the uh, drugs that many bodybuilders and athletes use is growth hormone in addition to anabolic steroids like testosterone. Because this builds muscle mass, right? This causes growth of muscles. Now, at the, at the biochemical level, growth hormone is increasing protein synthesis. It is causing amino acids to be joined together to form proteins such as actin and myosin. So it's increasing protein synthesis. Now, earlier today, we mentioned we learned a hormone that promotes the breakdown of proteins. What was that? Cortisol, glucocorticosteroids. So glucocorticosteroids actually cause proteins to be broken down, turned into sugar and fats. Growth hormone is the opposite. It actually causes uh, uh, amino acids to be joined together and form proteins. Rather than being broken down, it causes them to be made. That's an anabolic process. But you'll notice that growth hormone causes glycogenolysis and lipolysis. What's that? Glycogenolysis is the lysis, the breakdown of glycogen into glucose, so that glucose can be used as a source of energy. And it causes lipolysis, the breakdown of triglycerides into fatty acids, so that fats can be used for energy. So we see that growth hormone is anabolic and catabolic. It's not the only one. Thyroxin was anabolic and catabolic. The way that I interpret this is that growth hormone basically wants you to use carbs and fats for energy and not use proteins for energy. It actually wants you to make proteins. It's in contrast, the glucocorticosteroids like cortisol are causing proteins to be broken down and turned into sugars and fats so they can be used for energy. So all of these different hormones are affecting your metabolism. There are all these different hormones affecting different asset, aspects of your metabolism. All these terms that we learned back in section D, we're using now for all these different hormones affecting metabolism. Now, what causes growth hormone to be released is GHRH, growth hormone releasing hormone. Also low blood sugar levels because it raises the sugar levels, but I put it in parentheses. I won't test you on it. But that will also cause its release. I've mentioned to you before, all hormones have are really many actions and are, uh, are released in response to many things. I'm just trying to mention some of the more important factors and actions. And what would inhibit the release of growth hormone? Growth hormone inhibitory hormone, GHIH. It's also known as somatostatin and also high blood sugar levels because that will reduce the release of growth hormone and lower and reduce or shut off glycogenolysis and lipolysis. But again, I will test you on that. Those are in brackets or parentheses. Again, why in the case of growth hormone, just like in prolactin, why did we have an RH and an IH? Because there's no negative feedback loop. Growth hormone's not affecting, it's not a tropic hormone that affects another endocrine gland. Neither is prolactin. The, ones, the pituitary hormones that affect other endocrine glands follow a negative feedback loop, with the exception, of course, of sperm production in a guy. So on page 132, we'll remind you of something that you learned about in anatomy. In anatomy, you learned all about the structure of a bone, and you learned that bones, at least the long bones of our body, those that are in our arms and legs, 
grow, they develop and grow by endochondral bone formation. Endochondral bone formation. And that means they grow from hyaline cartilage. So let's look at uh, this picture right here. And I wrote, growth hormone stimulates the growth of bones at the epiphyseal plates. And I'll remind you of what that is. Here's the word and phrase, endochondral bone formation. This is, uh, you'll remember from anatomy, the end of the bone is called the epiphysis, and that's bone tissue. The middle of the bone, the shaft of the bone, called the diaphysis or shaft, it's bone tissue. The first place where a long bone changes from cartilage to bone is in the shaft or diaphysis. That's called the primary ossification center. The second place it ossifies, or the cartilage changes in the bone, is at the end of the bone, the epiphysis. And the last place where there's still some hyaline cartilage is called the epiphyseal plate, or growth plate. That's the last place where there's still hyaline cartilage. Bone tissue here, bone tissue here, hyaline cartilage here. Growth hormone stimulates the growth of hyaline cartilage at the epiphyseal plate. And as the cartilage grows, as it gets th thicker due to growth hormone, it then changes into bone tissue. As long as there's hyaline cartilage at the epiphyseal plate, that bone can continue to grow longer and longer. But eventually, when all of the hyaline cartilage has changed into bone tissue, once it's all bone tissue and no cartilage left, that long bone, that bone of your legs can no longer grow longer, and you're done growing taller. All of us in this room are as tall as we're going to get. Because our, in other words, if we were to take an x-ray of our bones, we would see it's all bone tissue. There is no hyaline cartilage. Now, in fact, this ought to be cool. Uh, this is an x-ray of an adult uh, uh, bones uh, of an adult around the knee. This is the femur and the tibia. And this is of an adolescent, a teenager. The bones are thinner, and you can make out that it looks like it's broken right here and here. Those are the epiphyseal plates. Where it looks broken is actually where there's a thin layer of hyaline cartilage. So as in the adult, you don't see that apparent break. There's no hyaline cartilage. The epiphyseal plate or growth plates have totally uh, ossified, and so there's no more uh, cartilage left. Growth hormone continues to be secreted our whole life. It does uh, promote protein synthesis in our body, it's, uh, and uh, it can cause, too much of it can still cause our bones to grow wider or thicker, but we, once there's no cartilage left, they cannot grow longer. On 134C, you'll notice that right here, a deficiency of growth hormone in a child results in dwarfism, because the Without growth hormone, which stimulates the growth of cartilage at the epiphyseal plates, the bones do not grow as long as normal. So the child is shorter than they would normally be. If an excess of growth hormone during childhood results in gigantism, where the person is bigger than they would have normally been, and in an adult, an excess of growth hormone in an adult cannot make you any taller, but it can make the bones grow wider or thicker and heavier. And that's called acromegaly. 